Thank you all for coming. This is a talk based on a paper that I wrote with Nick Kapoor, who is also at Fairfield University, and this is uh, Nick's cute title, Ahead of the Count. This is about, this is about probabilistic predictions of IRV elections. This is inspired by this thing you might have seen a few years ago. This is the New York Times needle. This was like a live uh, election prediction thing that you could watch all night long as the election is happening. And this, this little needle would kind of jiggle back and forth. And the idea is as the votes are counted more and more throughout the night of election night, um, the, uh, the needle will update live, giving you predictions of who, um, who is more favored to win. Live, live recalculations of predictions as the votes are counted. That's the idea. The needle is a probabilistic prediction. That is, it doesn't tell you who's going to win. It tells you like who is favored to win or what the probability is of, of who you think is going to win. And it updates live based on incomplete data. I mean, at the beginning of the night, they don't have any vote counts. But as the night goes on, um, they get some amount of data. And then they have to sort of guess the rest. All right, and the big question for our whole project is just um, what does it take to make a needle for IRV elections? That's the whole project. You know, moment by moment, the idea is the needle is compiling what data is available and then uh, giving you probabilities for who's going to win. So here's the, um, the sort of abstract setup that we're going to model the situation on. At each moment in time, we imagine that we have a probability distribution describing the votes. Um, for three candidates, say A, B, and C, your probability distribution might look something like this. So this is a big bunch of data about how many votes you think everybody is going to get. So for example, um, well, just look at the notation here. The column headings here represent certain rankings. So when it says A slash X, that means uh, these are people who voted for A in the top position and then ranked no second place candidate. A, B means they ranked A first and then B as their second choice and so on. Uh, and then these numbers here, like for instance this 0.33, this means that the probability that 100 voters will rank A first and then C, that probability is 33%. All right. And these are probability distributions describing how we expect the votes to be cast, but we're not making any assumptions on what these distributions are. So, you know, in real life, uh, it might be natural to assume that they're normal distributions, and you can use normal distributions if you, if you want, but um, we are not assuming anything about these distributions. They could be measured empirically if you want to do polling or something like that, whatever you like. All right, anyway, the big question is, given all of these probabilities that you see at the top there, can you tell me how likely is it for A, B, or C to win the election? And a little spoiler alert, here is, uh, here's what happens. You know, we do have an algorithm that can make this calculation. And in this particular example, we see A has this uh, 4.8 chance of winning, B is 86%, and C is something like 9%. All right, and actually our algorithm is able to produce what we call a weighted elimination tree. And what this represents is the probabilities of every round in the, um, in the IRV calculation. So um, what these numbers mean, for instance, this 74% here, that means that, um, of course, the first round has A, B, and C all in it. The probability that A is eliminated first um, is 74%. And then from there, uh, this 6.7 means the probability that you go from here to here um, is 6.7%. Uh, all right, this we call the weighted elimination tree. It describes all of the probabilities for all possible eventualities in this ranked choice election. And um, just, just to be cute, we decided to, um, to thicken up the lines in proportion to those probabilities. So the thickest line there is this one, which goes um, A being eliminated first and then C being eliminated. And you can tell that's, that's the most likely uh, trajectory by the thickness of the lines. All right. Now I want to talk about how do you how do you calculate all of those numbers? Each number we call an elimination probability because all of these numbers represent some probability of somebody being eliminated. For instance, um, this number, 74%, is the probability that A is eliminated in the first round. And then, for instance, this like 18.9%, that's the probability that after this round, um, A is eliminated and we end up with just B. All right. Uh, so really to, to compute all of those numbers, it suffices to just calculate what's the probability that somebody is going to get eliminated at some point. So for example, if I want to find what's the probability that A is eliminated first, all right, 
Now you have to remember the way that the instant runoff works. Being eliminated first means that A gets the fewest first place rankings in round one. So we want to uh, try and figure that out. What's the probability of that? Well, to get the total number of rankings for A in the top position, we have to sort of add together these three categories of votes. Um, of course, we don't actually add them, like literally the, the columns in that table, you don't just straight up add them. The proper way to add probability distributions is by doing a discrete convolution. So this is what we have to do. And this, uh, I'm going to call these tau A, tau B, tau C. These are the convolutions of these uh, three things each. So tau A now represents the total number of votes which put A in the top ranking. And tau B means the total number for B which put B in the top ranking and so on. All right. Yeah, these are the probabilities for each candidate's total in the first round. And these, uh, these um, convolutions are kind of a pain to do computationally, but actually uh, there is a fast Fourier transform algorithm to calculate these convolutions. So this whole thing is right quick. All right. And I'm going to just a simple thing. This is lambda A is the probability that these totals are more than I. So this tau, tau A of I would be the probability that the total is equal to I. This is just like a uh, cumulative version of that. Uh, but anyway, to find the probability that A is eliminated in the first round, we do this kind of sum here. It is um, this product means, so you should read this as, a has a total of i, but b and c both have a total of more than i, and this is what's going to lead to a being eliminated. All right, that's basically how it goes. Uh, anyway, in this particular example, if you do those convolutions and sums like I just described, these are the elimination probabilities for the first round, and those are the numbers that you saw in the in the big tree from before. And if you do this recursively, you can fill in all of these elimination probabilities. All right, and uh, just adding up sort of so this like 86% is the sum of this 67 plus this 18. These are the overall probabilities for a win by each of the three candidates. All right. Uh, here, just just for fun, this is a uh, an example of one of these trees for four candidates. Um, the algorithm is recursive, and you can do this for as many candidates as you like. All right. Uh, it runs pretty fast on a normal computer like this this very computer that I'm running the presentation on. Um, for three or four candidates and 500 vote buckets, it takes under one second. The vote buckets, that means like the, um, the number of rows in that big chart of probabilities that we're using. If you use more rows, that is a finer description of the probabilities, and so you'd expect it to be more, uh, more accurate to reality, but it's going to cost you a little bit computationally. But anyway, um, we found that if you use 400, uh, sorry, 500 vote buckets, this gets you um, pretty good results, and that takes under one second. Um, for, if you're doing with with five candidates, it goes up to 20 seconds. Six candidates, it takes 12 minutes. And this, uh, like most things with the IRV, the complexity of this whole thing is factorial in the number of candidates. So, it's not going to um, do very well for for more than that, really. Uh, but anyway, for three or four candidates, I said under one second. This is fast enough to calculate in real time, like that needle, right? So you could moment by n moment rerun the numbers and get a new um, a new probabilistic estimate. And we tried to simulate that. So if you look at the paper, you'll see several simulations of this type. Here is um, we're using real vote data from the um, the Alaska elections in 2022. And this particular is the Alaska House um, District 18. Um, I don't really know anything about Alaska politics, so I hope that this is not a um, high, high emotional uh, election for you. But anyway, this is a, an election between Franks, Nelson, and Gro. And what you see here going from left to right, this is a simulation of one of these sort of needles as we count the votes. So on the far left, you have basically everybody um, tied at 33% here because we don't have any information about the votes when we begin and we don't we don't have anything to base any predictions on but as you go to the right uh, gradually we count more and more in the votes and it becomes more and more clear that uh, the brown line grow is gonna win and by the time you get to the end grow is all the way up to 100% and these other guys are down at zero right uh, there's a lot of ways that you could try to visualize this you have to think a little bit outside the box you're not going to be able to make a, a needle with you know two sides to it but here you have um, uh, it's that same graph that I showed on the previous 
page, but this is an animated version of the elimination tree. And you can see uh, we begin with not a lot of um, specificity, but as the uh, count goes on and on, the uh, probabilities gradually uh, end up with hundreds and zeros once you know the true answer at the end. I should say this, in our opinion, is really only the very beginning of this work. Um, the biggest limitation, I don't know if you noticed this when I said this, but you, you should have noticed, this is a big deal. Um, we assumed that the probability distributions we're using are independent. That's, um, that assumption is baked into our use of the convolution, that these probability distributions are independent. But actually, in real life, this is almost certainly not going to be true, so I want to talk a little bit about this. In reality, we expect there to be correlations between the various voting um, totals uh, and and I mean I can think off the top of my head of at least two different types of correlations first of all there should be there probably are political correlations for example if candidates A and B are in the same party then people who rank something like ABC should be positively correlated with people who rank something like BAC that's just because if for instance um, it turns out as we're counting the votes votes for this ranking ABC end up being higher than we predicted then we should probably also expect that votes for this ranking are going to be higher than we predicted also because A and B are in the same party and we would expect people who like A versus people like B, those two uh, probabilities should kind of, in a sense, move together in real life. All right, so there, should, there ought to be co correlations of that type. And then there is also um, to consider what we call just purely formal correlations. That is disregarding politics at all, just because the strings are similar, if there's a ranking that says A, B, D, C, E, we would expect this to be, again, moving together or correlated with A, B, D, C, F, even if you don't know anything about the political situation, just because those two rankings, they are almost the same ranking anyway, so um, they we would expect those to be dependent as well, all right? The big question um, is how much really does this dependence matter? You know, our algorithm is assuming that things are independent. Probably in real life they're not actually independent, but um, how, much, uh, how much does that really affect the answers that we get? Um, the shorter answer is uh, it's hard to say. I mean, we, we do some, some kind of uh, basic um, some kind of basic treatment of this in the paper, but really this is something that, it, that deserves more, uh, more careful attention. Uh, I, I would say informally speaking, like there are some situations when uh, it probably does matter a lot. There are some situations when um, it seems to not matter at all. So this is worthy of more study. One more thing that I want to say about our algorithm, and we realized this as we were going along, the, um, the same algorithm that I've been describing to model this kind of a needle situation can also be used for the um, problem of a recount prediction. So this is a different application, but the same underlying algorithm can be used. The idea is um, after an election happens, of course, you know, sometimes you want to do a recount if you think it was a close election, but perhaps you're aware this problem of deciding if the election was close or not, that's, that's a hard question to ask, This uh, the margin of victory. If I show you a, um, an IRV election after the fact and ask you, was this a close election or not, that's actually not, a, not an easy question to answer. Sometimes the election seems close when really it really isn't, and the, uh, the converse is true also. Sometimes the election can seem um, like it wasn't close, but actually it was close. Um, Anyway, the idea here is, let's say we already have done the election, we have all the vote totals and everything, and we are considering doing a recount, all right? Now, when you do a recount, what happens is basically the vote totals that you get after the recount are basically the same as the ones you started with. They might change by a very small amount, but this is how recounts work. And um, how much generally do recounts change the, uh, the vote totals? You can look at like historical data about recounts that have happened. Um, Historical data that we've seen suggests that the recount shifts are normally distributed with a mean of about 0.08%. So that means if you're going to do a recount, you would expect all of your vote totals to shift um, according to a normal distribution um, on average with 0.08% of a shift. And there's a, there's a standard deviation that, that you can measure empirically also. All right, so anyway, what that means is if I'm considering doing a recount, the vote totals that I expect to obtain after the recount make nice probability distributions. And so we can apply our uh, algorithm that I've been deciding before. So our algorithm can probabilistically at least predict the results of the recount. 
All right. So there were, um, as an example, there were two recounts that happened in Alaska in this year, and we tried our, our algorithm on both of these. So one of them was Alaska House District 15. Again, I don't know anything about this election, politically speaking, but the candidates were McKay, Ibeck, and Wells, and there were 7,000 votes. And the way that this one worked was, in the first round, Ibeck lost by a fairly significant margin. And then in the second round, it was McKay versus Wells, and McKay won by only seven votes, which is a very small amount. So they did a recount, and uh, our algorithm, if you plug in the, um, the original vote totals to our algorithm, it predicts probabilities of a win of um, strong chance that M is still going to win. That's McKay. McKay was the original winner, so it makes sense that in a recount, probably it's not going to change the result. Anyway, in this example, um, we predicted that McKay would win with a 93% chance. Uh, Ibeck had no chance uh, at all, but then there was a small chance that um, that the recount could flip the result for, for Wells. And in real life, just in case you're curious, uh, McKay actually did win in the recount, so I guess we were right, right? <laughs> that was a joke. Um, there was another recount, Alaska State Senate uh, District E. Um, in this one, the candidates were Giesel, Holland, and Casey, and there were 14,000 voters in this one. And here's how this one went. Casey was eliminated in the first round by only 14 votes. So this one was close in the first round rather than the second round. Uh, and then in the second round, Giesel won the election. Um, they did a recount. So Casey, who was eliminated by only 14, requested a recount. And our algorithm, if you uh, run it on these numbers, gives these probabilities. Giesel to win after the recount with a 100% chance. This is something that we weren't expecting, but um, Actually, if you, if you look back at the political situation here, it's not hard to see why this is true. This was an example where it, it, the election seemed to be close, the, only by 14 votes, but actually it wasn't close at all. It's because um, Giesel and Holland are in the same party. So Casey was eliminated in the first round, and then Giesel won in the second round. But even if Casey had made it to the second round, Giesel and Holland's votes would have transferred to one another, and Casey had no chance of winning in the second round. So um, this seems to have been missed in the media, like all the media stories about this particular election and the recount. All, all they said was, you know, Casey lost by only 14, and so they're going to do a recount. Nobody, nobody seemed to realize at the time that uh, Casey had no chance of winning at all. Um, yeah, I, I made a little uh, YouTube video about this. I thought, you know, when we when we realized that this had happened, I was I thought I'm, I'm going to blow the roof off of this one. This is going to be a huge story, the most unnecessary recount ever. Um, nobody really watched that video, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, in this in this setting of recount predictions, actually our algorithm is is a little better suited to this than to the needle situation that I described before, and that's because um, in the recount uh, scenario, the independence assumption is actually, as far as I can tell, totally valid. Um, that's because when you're recounting the votes, um, for instance, if A and B are in the same party, does that mean when I recount A's votes, it should be similar to when I recount B's votes? The answer is no. It, they have nothing to do with one another. So these kind of political relationships or even formal, formal like relationships, similarity between the ranking strings, that has nothing to do with anything when you're just recounting. Those uh, recounted vote totals should be completely independent of one another. And so the, the, the recount stuff is, is probably a um, uh, sort of out of the box, a, a better, theoretically speaking, application of our, of our algorithm. All right, I already said that. Yeah, uh, but I will just say again, for the needle simulation, which I think is maybe a more interesting application, uh, that um, we would love to see some more work on um, incorporating these types of dependents, you know, that we're, we're pretty sure these kinds of dependents do exist in reality. It would be great to be able to incorporate them into the model as it exists now, but that's work for the future. All right, thanks a lot. Here you can see this is this is the paper that's on it's on archive. Um, you can also see um, there you'll see links to the code if you're interested in playing around with it. And then there's just a um, QR code for my YouTube video. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot.